staying with me today like it came up now again and it's uh it's sort of i go into panic immediately when i start thinking about do i quit my job the holy spirit how will that like how can he provide for me i have such a hard time trusting that <laughs> yeah it's, i remember i started to get a clue of this whole thing and i was like hmm i had student loans and um and I remember I was uh, I was pretty much through with the academia thing, but it was like in debt, and so it was kind of like I remember I thought, well, I'm going to have to let the Holy Spirit guide me on how to deal with these debts, you know, because this has to be practical, you know, it's not just some pie in the sky thing. You, you have to whatever we've done with the ego to wind ourselves into the world of deprivation, mm. debt, whatever, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter whether it's it's financial debt, or a friend of mine, Chris, he, he talked to me uh, about maybe a month, a little over a month ago, and he was just saying, he had to go back and talk to his mother, because in his mind, his mother was his debt. Literally, it felt like in his mind, his mother was his debt, and he had to go face that, and, and give and extend whatever he had withheld. It can be people, it can be finances, it can be debts of promises made that were not kept, or commitments made that were not kept. It's kind of like in 12-step program where they talk about doing like an inventory, like just going through your mind and, and saying to the Holy Spirit, okay, I'm coming clean, just show me anything, show me where my unfinished business is in my mind. It can be a number of things. But I remember in my case, um, I remember I thought, well, I had the course, I had the debts, and I thought, I'm going to have to handle those. So I really started getting into prayer and openness and asking, and I really felt like um, that a, a job would come along that would, it would mainly be for undoing the ego as fast as possible, but I think a, a side effect would be starting to pay off the debts, because that, that was something that had to be dealt with. And so, it's really, instead of trying to project it out into the future, like how how will I be provided for, how is this going to play out in the future, it was more like being open to the next step. And for me, it was taking a, a full-time job at Ohio Valley Goodwill, and uh, as, a, as a case manager, and Wow, this, the lessons I got there, things were coming at me so fast. I would be doing my Course in Miracles lesson, praying, meditating, listening to all this inspired music on the way there. It was a really intense job, just because it was so, it was so humbling. It's like, you know, where they say, knock, knock a chip off the block, you know, knock the pride off. It was like, the, mm. it was like there was so much encrusted pride from all those years of education and just life in general, just built up pride, like layers of thick pride. 
was almost like that job, it was like an eight month assignment, but it was almost like, it was like Jesus was getting like a chisel out, and just clink, 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 chipping away the pride. Every day it seems the pride was taking hit after hit after hit, as I worked with all these clients and I seemed to be, you know, all these difficulties. I mean, I, I sometimes I would do deep breathing before I would go into work because I would think, oh man, I don't know if I can handle this. I didn't think after the first three or four days that I would even last in the job. It was, it was one of these human services jobs where I was still trying to use my past learning to to do something and, and none of the past learning was working and Holy Spirit was like saying, well we're going to teach you how to pray, how to really open up to me and listen. And so it was, it was quite intense, those those eight months, and then there was another part-time job after that was to kind of finish off the debts, but that was intense too. Really, really intense lessons. And it's always a little bit, it's the toughest at the first. I mean, when you, when you get going in this and you start to really dedicate your life to it, it's usually, like the Course says, the branching of the road is the toughest part because you still believe you can go back to the mm -hmm. old way. That's why the branch is so difficult. I mean, once you start to, to go along the real alternative or the new direction, the first few steps are the most difficult, just because you really believe you can go back. And then when you really go through those first few steps and you keep going and going, that's when the momentum just starts to gain, you know, in your mind. You start to really feel like, okay, I'm going to do this. This is my life's work. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to I'm going to do the forgiveness work if it's the last thing I do. And so those steps are important and it's really the prayer of the heart. You know, it's like, I think for a lot of us we have these beliefs that are convinced, we've convinced ourselves that, that, um, that we don't, you know, have valuable skills the Holy Spirit can use or valuable abilities or we think we're just, it's just too much unworthiness to think, you know, even about the steps. And we've got all those how questions, you know, like, <laughs> what kind of job will I have? You know, we want to know everything. Just give it to me all, writ out, writ out in a, in a plan, and it just doesn't work that way. You know, we, we have to take those little baby steps of faith. And I remember I got interviewed for that job, and I went in, and I, I got, got the job, and the first job was intense, the second job was intense, but it just, after that, it's just started to turn and loosen up so that other assignments that came in after that, there was more of a momentum, you know. I just kept working with the Course and practicing and practicing. You practice in your relationships, you practice with every opportunity that comes your way. Like when you wake up in the morning, you don't want to miss one golden opportunity to really release and forgive. You don't, it's too precious to, to miss any opportunity. And that's what starts to turn the tide, turn the, the whole momentum. And one thing I can tell you that might save a little time is, you don't, the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to reinvent the wheel. So if you start to take a look at your life, if you go in yourself and you do like an inventory, whatever skills and abilities you seem to have developed from the ego and in the ego's framework, the Holy Spirit can use them in the plan of awakening. So for example, for me, I was in university for 10 years. So I picked up some vocabulary along the way. You hang around the university long enough, you're bound to do that. Uh, you read enough books, listen to enough professors, and whatever, it's just what you've exposed yourself to. So that was something the Holy Spirit could use. But it's different for everybody. Everybody, there's all kinds of skills that we have, and, and it's just, amazing with willingness how the Holy Spirit can can use whatever skills that are in there without having to reinvent the wheel. So, so you know, it, that's one thing that can be helpful about these kind of uh, retreats and gatherings is you start to get a sense that you have some strengths, you have some things that you excel in spiritually and you can bet that the Holy Spirit will use those those skills and abilities you know, even if you're just beginning to become aware of what they are, the Spirit can use those, and and does use those, and that's what the awakening's about. So, you know, uh, like we were talking, Melissa was talking about uh, 
she didn't, you got to get your fill of the kitchen here, uh, and you picked up a lot of skills, or, or maybe just became aware of a lot of skills that you had as far as organizing things and so on and so forth. She was even talking about, well, maybe down the road, maybe a B&B a &B retreat center or something. Now I, I, I open my mind to these principles, I open my mind to what skills I seem to have in, in terms of the world, and then I give them over to the Holy Spirit and say, you know, you bring me the best opportunity for this undoing, for the mind clearing. I had a friend, Dorothy, who, uh, she, she did not have a high school education. She was from Great Britain, but she didn't have a high school education, but she had kind of an aversion to, to schools. And I remember one time she told me when she didn't have a job and didn't have any money and didn't know what to do, that uh, she said to the Holy Spirit, okay, you're in charge now, you, you bring me my next job. And it wasn't long after that where uh, she had a couple job interviews and um, the job that she got offered was to work in a school. And mm -hmm. she was like, oh. <laughs> the very last place on earth that I would be comfortable working is the... She had said to the Holy Spirit, I will take the first job that is offered me. And the first job that was offered her was in a school. I have some friends that are in, in uh, Sweden, Anna and Alex, and Alex went through a phase where he had, he had left the profession of psychology and he was kind of looking for work and so on and so forth. and. And he was just praying, and he said to God, God, I will take, I'll take pretty much any job that you offer me, as long as it does not involve children. And the job that he was offered was working as kind of a school psychologist in a school, working with children all day. And after that, he became a, a kind of like a, what do they call it when you foster parent having children in his home? And to this day, that's still going on. It's like as soon as he offered up the prayer, I'll do any job you want except with children, <coughs> then it's been a flood of children coming at him. Because remember, this is about undoing. Initially, those early steps are about undoing whatever your resistances are. Okay, because it sounds to me like you're saying two things, that, uh, you know, we would be valued uh, by spirit for our skills, you know, like for our resume stuff, uh, which just doesn't play at all with me, because we're all the same, and our worth is established by God, and has nothing to do with what we do. And then, uh, um... Okay, so then if it's not the skills you have, uh, Holy Spirit will throw you into something you never did before, or that you don't want to do, uh, as a way to uh, knock down your pride. Well, I can see that. But, um, I mean, I still don't get this part about, uh, like, uh, planning what we want to do, like, as uh, ministers or... Uh, it smacks of achievement and, or ambition or uh, compromise. Somehow. Well, but the first thing was, you know, you were saying, why would the Holy Spirit use these skills or our resume or this and that if we're all this, if we're all the same? But that's precisely it. The mind that's asleep and dreaming does not know we're all the same. If it did, it wouldn't need the skills. It would, would see that the whole world of skills and abilities was, was an illusion. But when the mind doesn't see that it's all the same, and doesn't see that it's an illusion, it's, it's really a call for help in mind training, and a, actually a call for a complete transformation in consciousness. So the Holy Spirit has to use what the ego made to, to reinterpret the world. In other words, words are symbols that the ego made. There are no words in heaven. The words in Nirvana, those are symbols of symbols twice removed from reality, and the Holy Spirit uses the words to take the mind to a state of mind that, that's beyond the words. So you could say that the Holy Spirit would speak through you using the words to, to comfort and to bless, to, to reassure, to 
you know, to be an inspiration. And it's the same with, with the other skills. Uh, it's not like the Holy Spirit is like some kind of a, an employment agency, you know, it's like, okay, what do you got for me? I can type, how many words a minute? Uh, you know, it's not like the Holy Spirit is like a higher employment agency, it's that, that the mind that's asleep, it believes it's a separate human being, it believes in lack, it believes in deprivation, it believes in things like jobs, uh, because it, all it knows is lack, and it's going to have to survive somehow. So, you know, the reciprocity belief is strong, and so on and so forth. And, and progressively, those skills and abilities, how, whatever they were, however they were learned, you know, do get put into function. Like I was saying, you know, you had published a book, and those skills, whatever went into publishing a book, got used in helping uh, compile and uh, put together in book form the, the teachings that became Awakening to a Course in Miracles, that book. So, you, I know you always brush that off as lightly, like, well, it was a big collaborative effort and I did very little. But, those mm -hmm. were skills that were yeah. part of the, the repertoire that were used. Yeah. So, I mean, but isn't that... I don't know. I mean, does that just happens, or that's obvious, or uh, mm. what should I pay attention to here? Yeah, it's it's obvious. It's as obvious as you want it to be, in the sense that that I think when you have a desire to be truly helpful, uh, just like that woman in uh, the movie last night, you know, in the the guitar, she had a an like intense focus on well on healing quick, because she felt like her time was about to run out. And she just went at it almost with precision work, like a surgeon going in with a, with a finite amount of time to save a life. She went in, into her buying phase and, and her, you know, she had pretty good skills at buying. <laughs> she, she did it pretty rapidly and, and it actually, we were talking about the the colors and the textures and everything, it it got used in a very symbolic way and it definitely took the focus off of her throat, off of the laryngitis, off of the, the, the difficulty with breathing and she definitely got into a whole new rhythm uh, when she was going for the, that intense healing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty much the same with the Holy Spirit, you know, it's like it's like, it, it's really just getting your attention focused on being truly helpful. It's getting your attention focused on the giving mode. And I remember I, back in the mid-1990s, I had a girlfriend and oh, I would hear all these different explanations of the Course. It's a holy book, it's a scripture, it's, you know, one teacher said, don't let it touch the ground. Uh, you know, I mean, just all kinds of things about the Course. and. And I remember one time I heard somebody ask her, you know, what is the Course in Miracles? Because I'd heard so many answers of people trying to explain this, you know, this phenomenon or whatever it was, and they were having great difficulty explaining it. And she said, well, you know, how when a, when a baby, uh, you know, has, has a scattered attention, and they're, they're irritated and annoyed and crying and so on and so forth, how you can sometimes take a rattle and you can shake the rattle, you know, and get their attention so their head turns over to the, to the noise. She said, that's what A Course in Miracles is. Mm. I've never heard that kind of definition. A rattle? <laughs> a Course in Miracles is like a rattle. And what it was, was it was a very simple metaphor at shifting the focus of attention. And really, the Course, uh, Helen Schuckman, who was the scribe, said, thank God a path for intellectuals, for, for people who are well-educated. This is the rattle for the well-educated mind that needs to turn in another direction. It's really not that big of a tweak, just like it's not that big of a turn for the baby's head, but, but it's a very important one. I think I've interpreted to be truly helpful is to forgive. And that what I do in the world, that's really a mind activity. It's what I do in the world, or nothing. 
it doesn't really matter so much. But that's, I guess, yes, they're stepping stones. Yeah, that's, that's that. pretty much an interpretation. Right. The original Urtex had a phrase in there, listen, listen to my words and learn uh, of me, or learn of forgiveness and, and do what I say. It's listen, learn, and do. It was a three-part uh, instruction, and the last one was do. So, for the mind that is highly trained, and the mind that is highly ready and able to go into deep states of stillness and mystical experiences, yep, the doing aspect is almost nothing. It's zero zilch. Now what I've just described does not apply to 99.9999% of the population on planet Earth. It's just, we could say that, that the mind training is in its infancy. You know, it's like more like a, like a baby that uh, 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 just learned to crawl yeah. and not, you know, uh, a teenager shooting hoops. You know, it's not <laughs> that far along yeah. Yeah. yet. It's down to the crawling stage. Yeah. And therefore, it's really important to be very tuned in and very humble initially mm -hmm. at just working on your attitude, paying attention to your attitude. Because when he he talks about that in the in the manual where he said our change is required in the teacher of God's situation and he says for most they're given a slowly evolving curriculum but he does say kind of one general rule is that changes are required in the attitude mm -hmm. the attitude so before we start looking at making huge life changes you know it's like take a look at your attitude you know, does your attitude line up with the Beatitudes of the of the Gospels? And if it doesn't, then it's like that's where you know it would be the most helpful way to start taking a look inside. Like where, if I've got pride, if I've got arrogance, if if I'm not humble, and there's maybe I'm into analysis. Maybe I need a lot of proof, like so-called in the world, a lot of evidence before I'll 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 believe something or so on and so forth. You can start to take an inventory in that way. But in one sense, there is there is a, an aspect to the stepping stones which does seem to be involving doings. And even in the I Need Do Nothing section, he does say, you know, he describes this quiet place, you know, mm -hmm. where the activity of the body ceases to demand attention. He then comes right back and says, you'll be sent on many busy doings from that place of mm -hmm. silence and stillness. So, it's really to start to say, wow, he's given me 365 lessons and he's telling me I'll probably be sent on many busy doings in the mind training. And instead of sitting around and just getting in the lotus position and going through 8, 10, 12, 15 hours a day of meditation, he does call meditation tedious and time consuming. And, and he offers the holy relationship as is the way out, as the means that will serve best. And look at what we've been doing here with everyone. You know, mind training, uh, pouring out your thoughts, expression sessions. This is a, a relationship uh, intensive here, no doubt about it. And, and that's more in alignment with how we're practicing with the mind training than, than the old traditional ways which can be effective, but also take a lot longer time. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, it's like expect a miracle if you start to really get into this mindset, like, okay, I, I'm going to be a miracle worker. And I don't know the form that that will take, and I don't need to know the form. And I can just say, I am willing to be used. You know, that could be the prayer of the heart, use me in that capacity, and there's obviously plenty of opportunities around here, but but it's not like it's not like you have to go back to an outside world. It's more like just from being in this experience, you know, it gives you a pretty good glimpse of of an of another way of being, you know, of a, more of an expansive way of being. It, it doesn't have the same rigidness, <coughs> the same uh, heavy emphasis on rituals and so on and so forth. Yeah, you know, I've met people that go through an experience like this and 
you know, they, they start to be a little more contemplative about things, they, they watch their thoughts much more, they, they're really much more in touch with their emotions, and all those things are really helpful that will serve as you go along in a big way. And, you know, if you really have this great openness to say, okay, show me what's next, and you dare to make the prayer to the Holy Spirit and make <laughs> it obvious, really, Mean it with all your heart. Mm -hmm. Have the passion in your voice, you know. Just try it out. It's, oh, oh. You try that with the Holy Spirit. Make it obvious. I was just, uh, thinking about what Andy's talking about. And it does seem so much like unfoldment stages. If we are in an ego-driven ambition, regarding skills and talents and you know, fulfilling ego agenda, it seems like that does fall away and it has for a lot of us where there's just no drive, no ambition at all, no, no goals, no anything. And then out of that emptied out, completely surrendered state, involuntarily you just start to experience that you're being used, but there's no, there's no drive there. It just, mm -hmm. it, it's not personal anymore. It's an impersonal life. Mm -hmm. You're being lived and utilized. Mm -hmm. um, it's so incredible to take a step, like to do, or expose, or what is it, to have the willingness be shown. Because it is, it does change your mind. <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. And you can learn. I mean, when I share a lot about my journey, it's all about. I'm, the only reason I'm doing that is to save time. And and I know Noel. Just in the time I've known her, she's just shared about this, just this beautiful long journey of many many stages. And I could recognize, when she was telling me the story of her life, I could recognize all the steps, and I could recognize that sense of holding back and, and feeling of not worthy to do things, and long periods of years of holding back. And, and then, you know, it's like the, the art and the, the music just came bursting forth, almost like one of those, uh, those fast motion photography, you know, where they take fast motion photography of plants coming up out of the ground. Just come and shoot, you know, you see it and all of a sudden you see this thing going up like this and then, you know, the, the leaves and the, and the blossoms of the flower come out. When you do fast motion, you know, it's, it seems like more in the later part of your life with the, the music, you were convinced that you couldn't sing and that, no, that nobody really wanted to hear you and all those things that the ego uses, and then, now you know, you recorded a CD, and you're just traveling around the world sharing and singing, and all these harmonies, and overlaying the harmonies on the CD, and this and that, but that's been a pretty recent phenomenon, and the same with the, uh, with the art, all the spectacular paintings of art that are out on the website, and so on and so forth, but, but the steps, I mean, that's what I appreciate, is when I, when I hear the story, I can, I can recognize the steps. You know, Jesus always talks in the Course about a little willingness, but he does use the word great, words great willingness at one point to see that every event, encounter, and, and circumstance is helpful. It takes great willingness to see that all things work together for good. Mm. It doesn't take a little willingness, it takes great willingness. What is great willingness but uh, what seems to be the accumulation of many, 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 many moments of willingness in a lifetime. And when we're talking about a lifetime, you know, it's, it's just the time between birth and death, but from the reincarnation perspective, which is really just a, a metaphor, that it takes many lifetimes to develop uh, these kind of skills and to approach forgiveness. It wasn't like a Jesus just like, okay, yeah, go to planet Earth and get the job done and everything. It was, it was, there was, there was so-called lifetimes that seemed to precede that. 
in a, in a cumulative effect to, to reach that point of readiness for what we would call the lifetime back in Nazareth, you know, 2,000 years ago. And, and we've talked, I, I know uh, Noel and I have talked a lot about that because there's, there's even, Noel was saying, like an appreciation of that. Even though in the end, the experience is that, that it's all an instant, it's like you, you have to work with that which you can comprehend and grasp. And while time seems to be so real, you have to allow the Holy Spirit to use the symbols of time to reach your mind. Those, those cliches from the Course and those abstractions uh, that sound to many people like cliches, uh, they, they really don't work. And I've, that's probably the biggest complaints I hear around the world. Oh, Course in Miracles students. Oh God, what a bunch. You know, this, these, all this stuff about illusion, illusion. And you'll notice that if you look at, back at the Gospels, you know, you don't really find Jesus placing an emphasis on that the world's an illusion. Uh, if you read through all of the teachings in the New Testament, you don't really see an emphasis on that. But with the Course of Miracles students, oh, it's just an illusion, it's an illusion, it's an illusion. Cliché city. Meet the group of walking clichés. It's all an illusion. And, and you have to start to see that it takes enormous mind training to hold and to stay in that state that the, that the world's an illusion. That's what we call the atonement, or complete forgiveness. That's, there's nothing in the Course that Jesus says, now I want you to go around and tell your brothers and sisters on planet Earth, it's a real important message, go tell your president, your congressman, you know, your neighbors, your friends, your, tell your mother and your father, Go tell mama and dad, the world's an illusion. There's no instructions in the book to do that, to go speak those words. I, have, I found in my life that I, I went so deep into the Course, and then when I started traveling the world, do you know that most people in this world are not into metaphysics? At all? If you travel, if you go on trains and buses and planes and cars and rest areas, you go to restaurants and laundromats, and bus stations, you do kind of the cross, the cross world tour and you try to, to just pay attention to the people that you're with while you're doing it, you will soon discover that, that if you feel like you're in metaphysics, you're, you're in, a, in the minor, minority in this world. You know, you, do you ever turn on a political debate and see a discussion between politicians about Metaphysics? Do you hear it in the, in the butcher shop, in the grocery store? You know, what are people talking about? They're talking as if the dream world is a reality. Mm -hmm. Very rarely do you find people talking that the world's an illusion. And so that would be, sometimes we use the term metaphysical ghosting, ghosting over something. Using the cliché, it's all an illusion. To just go through your life and make that kind of, it's like putting a band-aid, putting a bunch of band-aids and little, little uh, post-it notes all over everything. Illusion, going around sticking them on everything. And if you did that in life and people came up and said, what are you doing? And you told them, they'd say, oh, you are crazy, going around putting post-it notes up, illusion on everything. Because, you know, that's where the mind training has to come in, that's where the practicality, or we've been talking a lot about feelings, really, really being honest with yourself of what you're feeling, and, and using that as your practice. That's what I did first, was before I tried any grand moves, was I thought, well, I'm, I am totally out of touch with my feelings. I am, I am totally in a state of denial and repression, and I don't even know how thick or deep it goes, but I, I could make an assessment. It was a pretty accurate assessment at the beginning that I was totally, totally out of touch with my feelings. And that if I was going to make any real headway on the spiritual journey, I really needed to get some access to those feelings and trust the Holy Spirit to show me how to do that. So, Lee was at the monastery, you know the routines of the monastery, 
these kind of movies on a daily basis or working on projects, watching your minds, meetings, groups, all kinds of encounters, all designed to really get in touch with your feelings in a, in a major way. So to me that's, that was a huge step for me and a very practical step. Feel the feelings. Wow, seems like a real simple statement, but it wasn't so easy at the beginning. It seemed quite, quite difficult. Surround yourself with inspirational music or inspirational movies. Or hang out with inspirational people. I mean, those are the kind of things I did initially. I decided, well, I didn't feel like I was in in a place where I could just let my mind just soar <coughs> higher and higher. So I just, you know, I made I made back in the days of cassette tapes. It kind of dates it, but I would make inspirational cassette tapes with stringing the most inspirational music I could find, because I felt good when I listened to it. So I figured I better just, instead of waiting for the radio to once in a while play <laughs> something inspirational, it would take matter into my own hands and listen to inspirational music all through the day. You know, why not? Who's, what's stopping you? Meeting inspirational people, thinking outside the box, asking questions that no one dares to ask. Asking those questions and having people tell you, you are a fool. You cannot just keep asking those kind of questions. Those are not practical. Get a life. And yet you say, I think it's pretty practical. I'm, I'm wanting to ask the deeper questions. They won't go away, so I'm, I'm going to ask them and see if that takes me deeper. You know, those are all, I think, practical things to do. They don't necessarily require huge shifts in form, it's just more practicing mentally, you know, shifting the focus mentally, initially. It doesn't cost any money either to start to shift your mind, you know, in a mental way and focus more on, on the mind watching and the mind training. It, it takes willingness and effort, but not necessarily a lot of money. It, it was good for me because I didn't have a lot of money, so. I couldn't have afforded $10,000 and retrain your mind. Oh, okay, well, better maybe another lifetime. Huh. So, when I get into that panic mode, like I did yesterday, kind of quit my job, and then I make up all this construct of what's going to happen, how am I going to take care of it, that's just me overdoing it. Yeah, I think it, it can be a bit of overdoing in the sense that if you are attempting like like radical moves like quitting your job and so on and so forth, it would it would be good, not necessarily that you would know the form that would come next, but to have kind of an inkling of a direction about that. Like I know for me it was there was a period of of time where I was really practicing with the Course, doing my lessons, doing the mind training, and basically I was thinking, well, I'm going to take these jobs and it's going to be the undoing of pride and it's going to be a very humbling experience when I take these jobs and I'm going to, you know, really work at paying off my loans, but, but I really felt like I had to give it over in terms of, I didn't know what jobs would be the best, you know, the kind of work that I would even do. You know, that was the thing. So, I think initially it's like there, there needs to be like a context. I think, um, you know, more and more as, as I go along and the more and more people I work with, with the monastery for example and with the idea of starting a center over here in Europe like uh, Carla and, and Susanna are looking at now. And, and what we're doing over in Australia is there's, we're starting to work on, just like you have uh, schools, trade schools to learn bricklaying or to, to learn a trade, 
And just like we have educational schools that are designed to learn skills, I think that's really kind of where we're heading is, is we're working on, I mean Mary Baker Eddy had a school of metaphysics in Boston that people literally came to and, and studied the metaphysics. The course is a great self-study book for that, but, but we're more now working on ways where people can come together and pour their energy and their, their skills and abilities and their mind in very focused ways to, in very collaborative ways towards the undoing. You know, that's, that's a, a phase that I think we're doing now. I know with the monastery, Lisa recently was talking to me and she said, this is, this is like a school. Like, people come here, it's like a school of undoing, uh, is what it seems to be developing. And, in one sense, I think once you start to raise some of this stuff up consciously, then you do see that there's a need for, for undoing, and you do start to open yourself to pay attention to the mechanisms of the undoing. Bye! Bye! <laughs> and, um, that can be helpful too. I mean, you know, in the sense that you're more consciously aware of the undoing process, so instead of trying to do, 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 or to fulfill, fulfill in, in other kind of ways, try to meet self-concept goals, you start to realize you're ready for the self-concept to be dismantled. Then you watch a movie like the one we watched yesterday, and you think, wow, that was relatively quick dismantling, you know. Uh, maybe it was under the context of, I'm going to die soon anyway, so what have I got to lose? But, like we were saying at the end, you don't have to, to be diagnosed with a terminal illness to do this. You know, it's like just giving yourself that, that sense of, okay, well, I'm, let the undoing begin, make it obvious, and so on and so forth. And I have just seen so many cases and experiences in my life where very unexpected things can seem to happen in a rapid succession that are part of the undoing. I think that movie was a good illustration of that. You know, she didn't plan on hearing from the doctor that she, she was going to die that quickly. She didn't plan on getting fired. She didn't plan on having her boyfriend say, I need space, you know, get out of my face. She didn't plan on, when she got into that, uh, that big uh, loft apartment, she really, she just sat there kind of crumpled over. I don't think she had any plans for that, but, but they did happen in kind of rapid succession. I think so rapid that she pretty much, she lost track of time. Uh, while well, it was happening, it was happening so fast. To me, that's just an inspirational film, and I've seen lots of them, and and I really I love seeing character transformation films like that. That's kind of a rapid succession character transformation, you know, symptoms leaving and all this and that, and a total like she changed everything in her words, and um, you know I I think you just have to start to open to. The changes uh, can seem pretty radical, but they can also be very, um, very, very helpful. I know there was, I had an assistant back in like 19, 1990s, like around 1997 to like 2002 or something around those areas, and, and basically Kathy, she was so willing and things happened in my life so fast, and it was almost like I, I was in these fast orbits, that, that things around me happened very fast with people, people that I would meet. Um, and they still tell me that, that they've gone through major life changes when they met me, and I, I don't see them for three or four years, and they go, you won't believe where I'm at now, where my life is. Like when I first met you, they, whoa, it was a huge dismantling, and then that happened, and that happened, and that happened. Um, my friend Susanna in the Canary Islands, she translated for me in Colombia for 10 days. And she, when she got back to the Canary Islands, her whole life as she knew it, capsized. It went, it went down so fast, like, like the Titanic. 
I was thinking. It just, it wasn't anything she was even consciously aware of. She just translated from you for 10 days, and then when she got back, everything crashed. Her relationship, her career, her family, everything took, took a dive. And it's just recently that she's pulled kind of out of that deep nosedive and total dismantling to a point of now she's you know, she's much more on her purpose. She's, she's the one that wanted to open maybe our first center over here in Europe mm. because she's gone through such a thorough dismantling of everything else. And now she's zooming, zooming higher and higher and faster and faster with gaining much more confidence very rapidly. Mm. You know, and Carla, I think, who's off today with the quad, you know, she's, I think she's going to join with Susanna and leave her life as an artist in New York and come over here to Spain and and launch into, you know, a, uh, a Course in Miracles Center over here. Now that's another example, another story of a rapid turnaround, and I think those kind of things are happening more and more, but, but those are just examples, KJ, of uh, what's, what I think starts to become, even in the realm of a possibility of a next step. Um, it seems to be that it goes easier and faster when you're with a group that are going through the same thing. I think, I mean, I've been watching this thing go on for, this is like the end of the fifth week, and we've had some major dismantlings, and, and some people's lives are really falling apart at the seams, you know, without too much resistance. <laughs> Just cracking, 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 cracking. And breakthroughs, breakthroughs, like the song that that Francis was singing today was like a coming. It's like her life's going to like this, and then you know, like getting that email from your mother, and then what we talked about in the expression session. She's pulling, <laughs> pulling out of the nose dog. Yeah, there she goes. She's singing her song, you know, to her mother. You know, she. But that's. That's pretty much the way that uh, that it goes. It's 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 a dismantling, and when you're going through it together, the, it just seems to accelerate. And also, the pulling out of it is is the same thing. When Francis pulls out, then others seem to benefit from that. Like, whoa! Look at her go. She was almost ready to hit the ground. <laughs> this pulls out, you know. That's important, pulling out of the nosedive, you know. <laughs> Emotionally, you know how that feels when you're in a nosedive. You're just going down, 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 and it feels like you're going for a crash landing, a hard crash landing. And then when you pull out, that's inspirational. And I think, you know, that's, that's a big part of it. I, I was inspired by those that I met. When I first started with the Course and first started traveling, the Holy Spirit said, I'm going to go and I'm going to take you to meet people that are working with the Course in a very dedicated way on a full-time basis. You know, that was an interesting trip. It wasn't so much what the people said, but after I started going around and meeting these people that were working with it on a full-time basis and had dedicated their life to it, that was very inspiring to me, just that, that they were doing it. To meet them in rapid succession, one after another, after another, after another. I remember that first trip out, you know, I'm going across the country, I, I met a psychiatrist that was doing the course full time with white hair, and, and in St. Louis, I went on down, I went down to Sedona, I met Robert Perry and his wife then, Susan, I went out to California, I met Beverly Hutchinson and her mother went out there. I, I just went on this trip and was guided to meet people along the way. Some that I planned on meeting and others that were just came across my path. But after that first trip of meeting all these people that were doing it full time, I just thought, hmm, I guess I could do it too. <coughs> if all of them can do it, I guess I can do it too. See, it was a, a uh, an inspirational trip. It wasn't so much the words they said, but they were doing it, you know. And I was inspired by that. 
And I was inspired by the books I read and the, and the stories that people told me of the pioneers. Just like you have the pioneers of the United States or the pioneers of the founding forefathers of different countries and civilizations, we have, I found the Course in Miracles pioneers and they inspired me that they had the chutzpah to try to change their minds so radically, you know, and turn away from the ego. So I think that's, that's another part of it. So, for that dismantling, if I'm in an environment where, where a lot of shit comes up, like, I shouldn't be talked to this way, this job is beneath me and all that, that would actually be perfect. Yeah, that was, that sounds like my first environment. <laughs> well, that's where I'm at. In. It's like, it sucks. it's the worst place for comfort. Yeah. So, mm. and then all the pain and all the fear would come from resisting, learning and letting go. Yeah, I think too, the other thing about working on an oil rig is, that, what is it, you work for a couple weeks? Two weeks. And then you have how long off? Four. Four, oh, well. So you get your little compressed, intense session for two weeks and then four weeks, which is more unstructured time, which, you know, in that sense, that's pretty valuable too. Instead of just being in a job that's completely structured all the time, <coughs> without any unstructured time, you know, it just gives you a lot of uh, flexibility for travel, for for meditation, for being used by the Spirit. You know, you could be out and about all over the place doing all kinds of assignments for the Holy Spirit in that unstructured time, and then just facing a lot of, uh, we'll say, dismantling of pride <laughs> on the oil rig. Mm -hmm. You know, as you're getting in touch with your emotions, you know, that's a that's an intense process, and you can see where it helps to be with others that are going through that same process of getting in touch with their emotions. But um, you know, the Holy Spirit is very very practical. So if you do have debts um, or you have things that that are loose ends that have to be tied up, it's like you know, well. It's, it has to be done, and what's, what better use of time is there than to start clearing things up? Just starting wherever you start. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what I did. I, I had no clue how it was going to happen, but I just kind of started, okay, here's where I'm at, so here's where I start. And I just kind of went along day by day, you know, doing my mind training, doing my lessons, and being content, you know, to let the miracles come into my life and then the other stuff to get handled in some way. Yeah. <laughs> and it will get faster too, you know. It's it's gonna pick up as you go along. As the dedication, you know, continues, it's gonna be opportunities, opportunities. I would go to like like these things I I didn't go to anything that was six weeks long or or even four weeks long, but even when I would go to a, like a, a workshop or a a day-long thing or a weekend thing, it would be very inspiring. I would really look forward to it. Like it was like getting a supercharge of my batteries. Then I would go back with my practice in a very steady, steady, steady way, but I would just get supercharged, you know, where I'd have the opportunity. And I'd save my money for these kind of uh, events, you know. I, I mean, to me that was the most impactful use of my resources. So they call that the biggest bang for the buck. What is it? Sp I would go to spiritual workshops or get particular books or, you know, whatever that felt like would really give me a jump start, get my momentum really going, surging. The Spirit's very practical. I found all the way in my life, everything's been highly practical. It's not kind of a wishful thinking, kind of, oh, I'll see, I'll shoot for this and shoot for that. It's, it's been very practical. Thank God. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, if you look at the life of Jesus in those three years, only twelve times did he really use those words, follow me. And that was for the apostles. But you think about all the encounters he had, all the people he met, all the places he traveled, and he only used those follow me words like twelve times. It's not really a lot. The message, he was saying it really to the whole universe. But practically speaking, he only spoke those words, you know, as far as leave your jobs, leave your families, leave everything right now, drop it now, <laughs> and follow me. He only used that twelve times. And for those twelve that said, yes, what a wild ride. They had no idea what that yes meant. They didn't have roller coaster rides back in those days, but it was more intense mm -hmm. than the nastiest roller coaster ride at an amusement park. It was an emotional roller coaster ride. And it didn't end when Jesus left. It just was, that was just the beginning. Exposing. I'm flushing up the unconscious. We have mystics and saints like St. John of the Cross, you know, the dark night of the soul. If you read some of the writings of the mystics and saints, it's like dark, dark, dark. Like they were publishing their writings for the rest of the world, like, okay, I've been down to the unconscious. I have just one word for you. Dark. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's more pronounced. Dark. <laughs> if I was translating you, I, I should do that also. <laughs> or squirrel. <laughs> right. But you have to say it into the squirrel. You have to, you know, you have, to have the microphone for this. <laughs> yeah, we were, it's all funny because it's like, it's, it's really where you're coming from, because we were um, looking at, Lee, Lee came up with this pronunciation from, how about we say it for, see, Isabel has not heard you say the word guilt, so just say, say the word guilt to her and... Guilt. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, that's what we went, we went. It just doesn't have a heavy feel to it. It's very light. Yes. Like a smiling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can hardly even say it anymore without smiling. <laughs> <laughs> or hear it without thinking. Or hear it without thinking. Right. There it is. It's, you hear that, that higher pitch there? <laughs> You can't help but laugh when you hear it. But that's what it seems to be more and more, that we're, we're getting lighter and lighter with that feeling, you know, because it's, because there's such joy and lightness and laughter, you know, and that's the presence of transcendence, you know. How can you not be happy, you know, when you, when you start to just feel that and express that more and more and more, it just feels lighter and lighter and lighter. If you hang around this group, you'll hear lots of happy songs, and you know, it's, it's just, that's the beauty of it. It's like a natural expression. And it's just a, I think too, you start to find that, that the happier you feel, you just, you just really are aware that you're drawing a lot of witnesses to the happiness. It's not like there's, you're special, or lucky, or fortunate, or any of those things, because that doesn't make any sense at all, but it's just that as you open to the happiness, you, you see a happy world, you draw happy witnesses. And uh, that sure makes it a lot easier, you know. You can't, you know, you end up having laughing parties, and, and cuddle puddles, and all kinds of things that are, that are so light, you know, that, that you think, oh, okay, this is good stuff. When I was in Canary Islands, it's, my friend uh, um, 
Susanna was just saying, oh, over there in Colombia, she said, everybody was just cracking up. She said, when we first got there, she said, we laugh a lot in Spain, but oh, we had, were not prepared for just so much laughter and laughter and lightness. And, uh, you know, it's especially too, I mean, maybe some people would say, well, that's like somewhat cultural, but we were with Course in Miracles students everywhere who were really kind of waking up, so it was even more pronounced, even more lightness and laughter than, than maybe average, so to speak, so, you know, and that was beautiful. That was a great heart opening experience for me. I feel very grateful. Absolutamente spectacular. <laughs> yes. <coughs> okay, well, unless anybody's got anything else, I think. It's another great movie night. I have a question. Yes. I was, when you were talking, now, I was thinking about the people that I work with at my last job. A terminal ill, deceased people, and, uh, young people, old people, and um, I'm just, I tried to work with that. How can I see them as a witness for like happiness or, you know, I tried to understand when I was at work and always follow my love and inspiration and, and but I wasn't really able to to do that. So no, I had quit my job. But uh, like, if I went back, they would still be there. So I'd like you to, you, don't, you know, I don't see it because I don't go there. But you mean something else. Well, it's, it's like steps. I mean, I I remember being guided to work in a hospice, yeah. and. Um, and it was a really valuable experience because I was pretty, pretty deep into the mind training at that point when I went to hospice to, to work, you know, pretty steady there. And uh, I guess it's, it was just my frame of mind because when I went there, um, I seemed to draw a lot of comments because people, it was almost like I was like a breath of fresh air. A, I was like a breeze blowing through the hallways. Because I didn't feel the, the heaviness. To me that was not a heavy situation. It was quite light and um, I was quite joyful uh, there at hospice. And whether I was taking trays of food to patients or talking to patients, it was quite mystical too because I would, I would be called into rooms and we would have these deep, kind of metaphysical talks, short metaphysical encounters, where it's like people, their souls were like mm -hmm. asking me their deepest questions, and and I was Holy Spirit was answering them, and then they would often check out. The, instead of raising the dead or healing the sick, I had a really high checkout rate. I, I could go clear a ward out <laughs> in a hurry because. Mm -hmm. Because you see, it's not about resurrecting the body, and it's not about healing mm -hmm. symptoms, it's mm -hmm. about the release of guilt, and all my messages to these people that are, were in hospice, mm -hmm. that were hanging on, literally trying to hang on to the world, and hang on to the body, was I was saying to them, I was telling them in different ways, what a great job you've done, mission fulfilled, you're sinless, you're guiltless, I was seeing them for who they were, mm. and they responded many times by laying the body aside. Mm. Because they were just hanging on to it out of guilt, feeling they were going to hurt loved ones and leave loved ones behind in difficult situations and so on and so forth. And I was, I was like, that's nonsense. It's nothing to do with anything. And so I was doing a lot of communication with them, with my mind, and it was all about innocence. It was about pure mm -hmm. divine innocence, and that's why the checkout rate was was so high. And um, I think that's important to, to remember. It's like when you've been trained as a medical doctor, the 
the background, the, the training has been to save lives. And the training has been to heal the sick, and the sick being sick bodies. And once you start to realize that, that really healing is all about innocence, and, and it's about giving the mind permission and allowance uh, to release and relax and let go. And once you see that that's all that it's about, and it's not about trying to preserving life in the body, because there never was life in the body. Uh, you know, there is no life in the body to save. Uh, and you can see how the medical profession's got everything backwards and twisted mm -hmm. upside down. But, you know, in that sense, I, I wasn't handicapped because I didn't have anything of the medical profession in my mind anymore. I mean, I had gone through myself, gone to doctors and dentists and things over the years, but then my mind had been freed of that, you know. And, um, and in kind of a pretty radical way, I was, I was pretty freed of it. So, so I, I wasn't handicapped by any false ideas. And it's very much like I've heard people say, if they've been pretty steeped in Christianity, or in Catholicism or whatever, a lot of times they have great difficulty with the Course. Because they have so many, so, so many past connotations of what the words mean. And Jesus is taking with the Course, the meanings, into a much higher realm. And they have much more difficulty letting go. And they will tell me, I wish I wasn't so steeped in this religion, because it's blocking my, my growth with the Course. You know, I, I'm reacting and responding to these old words and what they mean what I thought they meant, and Jesus is using them the same words, but in an entirely different context, pointing in a whole different direction, towards guiltlessness, towards pure innocence, and not towards any sense of wrongdoing, or shame, or, or punishment, or whatever. So, so in that sense, you know, the, all that was learned about the medical model, or all that was learned about Christianity, you know, can be a tremendous block to the awakening. The more you've learned in this world, the more handicapped you are. Mm -hmm. And the less you've learned in this world, the, the closer mm -hmm. you are to awakening. I mean, I work with... Yay! Yeah, she's... <laughs> I'm yelling because I'm like, yay! A living <laughs> smile on her face. <laughs> yay! Yay for the Angelicas! And the Isabel Christinas and the JPs of the world, yay for the ones that that don't aren't steeped too much because they're like the witnesses of what's possible. You know, get ready for the young generation, the crystal children, mm -hmm. the the ones that are showing up now that are you know that are so bright and and happy. They're they're witnesses to your own mind mm -hmm. <laughs> to to what's possible, you know. So that's really, really beautiful. And then we always have great reminders from the movies of the ones that are so simple and so bright. When I worked with the, with the handicapped and the mentally retarded, it was such a great job because when I was working with, with people, young people, maybe 18, 19, 20, 21, with, that were diagnosed with mental retardation, what a happy bunch we were. I mean, we really were happy. And it showed me how everything in this world is upside down and backwards, you know. To the world it was like, oh, the poor, these poor people, they will never have a full functioning life. And they were so happy, they were almost like, their souls were going, you fools! <laughs> you fools that diagnose us and think that we're the problem, yeah. and that we are deprived, you know of intellectual skills and capabilities, you know, what good do all your intellectual learnings do for you when you have stress and doubt and, and go plodding along every day, living by the clock and punching a time clock and driving your Mercedes and your Rolls Royces and whatever. What good has this affluence done when it brings you no joy and no happiness and no peace of mind? If their souls could speak, <laughs> you know, and articulate, that's what they would say. But they didn't have to speak it, they just, you could see it in their eyes. You could see it in their faces. 
They were simple, much, much more simple, much closer to the truth, you know. Mm -hmm. I feel such gratitude to working with those types of clients, so to speak. It was just a beautiful blessing to my mind. David, I, I don't know, but uh, the, the answer you give, gave me doesn't help me. Like, it doesn't say anything to me. Because it, it was, where I worked, it wasn't about saving lives anymore. It was about these things you talk about now. Like hmm. we, just to talk, to, to work with the people and, and to help them to come to be at peace to take away the guilt. We were very, very open communication there and looking at all these sides and like being, you, you can feel intuitively if there is something in the family that needs to be spoken about. And yeah. we, op we opened up for that all the time. Like we do here in a way, yeah. every day, every day. But, and, and there was a lot of joy, a lot of humor, a lot of laughter, a lot of fun, a lot of creativity, you know? And, uh, but the witnesses doesn't go away. You know, that's what I'm asking for. Why? What do you really mean? What is the witness that I shall see there? Uh, the people dying in front of me. What, what is it that my mind shall see? I see the innocence, yes. And I see the people who are at peace when they die. And, mm -hmm. But what is it I want to see? You know, that's what I'm asking you. Yeah, I think, I think that was maybe a phase in your life. And it feels like, like now you're, just like Noel went through more phases with, with art and music and everything, it's like, the happiest I see you is when the, the, the creative spirit is just flowing through you like a child. Like, without any kind of a sense, I mean, those, those kind of things you're talking about are all, you know, to the extent that you could feel the connection there, you could feel the joy, you could feel the helpfulness, that was all good. It's like listening to some of Noelle's stages in her life or some of mine. But I think now you're called into higher and higher realms, you know, it's like Jesus saying, why would you use the wings of a sparrow when you could use the mighty wings of an eagle to soar, you know. So you can start to look and say, all that was helpful and maybe you couldn't, you know, see past the death or the sickness to some extent, but it's like that was just part of the training. That was just a stage, that was just a phase. And when you get into playing your your flute or your trumpet or your clarinet, when you get into dancing, when you make your paintings with these bright, brilliant colors that, that are so expressive now and everything like this, that's another uh, use. I mean, th that doesn't have a lot of connection to the life that you lived as a doctor, uh, as a gynecologist, you know, or in those kind of settings you're describing and everything. It's just taking you up. It's like, instead of going through lifetimes, it's like you can think of that as like a past life. Uh, and now you, you're in another life. And, and there are many, many possibilities in this new life. And, and you're just excited, like a little girl, with curiosity and anticipation to see how those will unfold. And um, it's beautiful too. I mean, I didn't imagine any of this for myself. I mean, I, I had no imagine, imagination of like this as a life. Um, uh, you know, I was inspired by music and I just couldn't, I couldn't have fathomed anything the way my life has gone. I mean, it just seemed to go on and on and on to more and more realms that were way beyond anything that I, I could have ever imagined. Just like huge vistas opening up and then you go, oh my god, and then another one, and then another huge vista, then another huge vista. It's like, how many huge vistas can you have in a lifetime? It just kept coming and coming and coming. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, it's still happening for me, you know. I think it's like recently just getting paired up with, with Noelle and she's very, very expressive in many, many, many ways. You know, every day I find out something else that's expressive. I didn't know she could 
pick up a golf ball with her toes. I mean, Whoa. Uh, you know, Whoa. she has very dexterous toes. But they're, I can pick up a quarter with my toes. Pick up a quarter even. I mean, these, you find these little expressive skills and abilities that you... It's just... And, and there's so many opportunities when you can, when you travel a lot, traveling, singing, talking about wonderful metaphors and examples, you know, drawing from the pool of whatever's there, you know, that, that Noel has lots and lots and lots of experiences. It's a deep pool, and we both have access to this deep pool. So it just, it's just another vista of, of interesting possibilities, you know, to go into. You have no idea what, cl what clue, what kind of songs or humor or expression or whatever will come through. And, but that's the way you approach life. You approach life just opening up the parameters and saying, okay, it's your, it's your life to use, God, Holy Spirit, use it for, for the highest good. And when you make that your prayer, it's quite amazing, it's quite powerful what can happen. The potentialities that are all there, that are just, that are not in awareness, they suddenly start to come into awareness. Skills, abilities being used in ways that you never foresaw before. Like for me, I mean, I enjoyed watching movies, but not, not giving these kind of interpretations to movies. And these weren't the kind of movies I was watching, you know, 20 years ago. It's, it's just opened and opened and opened and people keep passing them along. So to me, it's, that's what makes it the adventure of it, you know. It's certainly not boring. I mean, I'm, I'm just open to the adventure and the collaborations, and I have a feeling, you know, there'll be more collaborations. Right before I flew to Europe this time, I filmed two movies. Two movies before I came here. One was in, uh, both of them were in the same place, actually. They were both in a studio in Louisiana. And Noel was there for, for, I guess for both of them. It was kind of funny for her to watch, because I was asked all these rapid-fire questions, and had to give short, succinct answers to the questions, and so that was kind of a fun, fun one. But, and I have a feeling, you know, it's just going to continue with, with things like media, movies, different expression, means of expression, the Holy Spirit will just continue to use those, you know, in just in ways that maybe we can't imagine at this point. They talk about teleportation, well, that could be an interesting thing, instead of having to, to fly. <laughs> See? Noelle's really open to that, so... <laughs> totally, I'm ready. <laughs> molecular transfer. Wow. There it is. Beam us, beam us up, beam us here, beam us there, you know. Yeah, in fact, uh, I guess Jackie went to bed, but she was telling us about a friend of hers who's, who's bi-locating now. Uh, and so, you know, these kind of things that, you know, people say, oh, well, that's Star Trek and da 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 A lot of things in Star Trek is, it's, maybe we're supposed to be way, way off in the future. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it seems like they're much more in the realm of, uh, of the possible, of the possible, and possibilities. So, that imagine just if one little thing clicked, like teleportation, how different the world would be. All those buses and trains and boats and you know planes and all these things. You know that all this time and devotion to to being different places. I mean, some of you have heard of our mystical mind training program. And it's called, it's an educational program called Moodle, it's a platform. But I don't know, how many of you have heard of Sloodle? Even, even Noel, who's not into technology, got all excited when I talked about Sloodle. And people think I'm pulling their legs when I start talking about Sloodle. But Moodle is a three-dimensional uh, educational program, so we have great movie clips and and music and meditations and things on the internet that people can access with the click of a button. But Sloodle is virtual reality added to the content that we're putting up there. So for example, you could go onto Sloodle and take on an avatar body 
and go mm. flying off to maybe to the musicians pavilion or something and join with people who are in other locations in the world but you join electronically, virtually, you know, on the web for this kind of content. Mm. So instead of feeling like you're kind of just going through this alone, you could get your avatar body and go off exploring in the virtual world for metaphysical encounters. Uh, when I was telling Noelle, she was like, oh, where do I have to go? Do I have to have special gear? Do I have to put on headgear? And such? No, no, it's not, not that much, but we've, you know, we've had uh, Thomas and, and Sarah have already been off with their avatar bodies, uh, you know, before. The Stoodle is not a thing of the future. It's, mm -hmm. it's actually here. We just have to catch up to what's available now, technologically speaking. That Sloodle will be like mystical mind training in, in an, another dimension, just adding on another dimension in terms of the interactions. And so, hold on to your hats. <laughs> it's going to get interesting as you go forward, but there's lots and lots of possibilities with, with when the Spirit uses these things. The Spirit's use of technology will, mm. will continue at an exponential rate, you know. Already they're calling me a tech mystic. Because I'm into the tech. But why not? The spirit's like, I'm having fun with it all, so. <laughs> Quantum tech mystic. Yeah. I'm already, I'm, a, I'm not bi-locating or tri-locating, but I'm multi-locating because people write to me and they tell me I show up in their dreams all mm. over the world. Sometimes they'll say, were, were you aware of what you told me last night? Hmm. Which David was that? <laughs> what country were you in? we we'll have to do a log of <laughs> Davids that show up in I'm different just dreams. I remember about that dream that I had when I, when I came to see you that day. That one day silent retreat, remember I told you I had a dream about mm -hmm. you? Yeah. And I did. I, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I, I pretty much, I think I remember something like, you, 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 in the dream you said, Melissa, just come, I'll save you. And you <laughs> did, you saved me. And you came. <laughs> I came. <laughs> I came and yeah. my life changed. Yeah. Within like two weeks, I was yeah. coming to Spain. <laughs> yeah. And my life's changed so much since then. Yeah. I'm just so amazed because it did. It was just, I was so willing, I was so ready. To leave the pain of the life that I was leading. Yep. And I didn't care what it took. Yep. And you took the steps too. We had we had our chats on our cell phones. Mm -hmm. Your Kentucky cell phone to start off with. And because you had the had, had moved from right where I was. You're like, What? I moved out of here and you were just there and then <laughs> But it's like we you know, to talk on the phone, to go through things, you know, those, that's, it just takes a willingness to have that contact, you know, and that's what I felt when I started traveling around and meeting people and I remember that line from the Course where Jesus says, the willingness to communicate attracts communication. And I didn't fully understand what that meant, but now, more and more I see that I've just been so willing to share my heart and communicate and then the communication gets reflected back in wonderful loving ways like that. So it's, it's, a, it's a very intimate connection and it really is life-saving when you think about it. Because mm. these deep dark emotions and these old patterns, you know, something's got to break the spell. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a, a spell from one of these fairy tales. Like having a, a wicked queen cast a spell on you or something and then you've got to find a way to break the spell. And then you find it is, it does work. You know, we're on our way. And it just becomes easier and easier and easier. Because yeah. the answers come and they're so clear. Mm -hmm. I think that's why I try not to worry as much as I used to worry. Because, well, it, and I've learned it with this course, is that when I resist, it makes it harder. But when I just, just let it go, everything falls into place and it works perfectly. More perfect. I mean, 
So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> start to be singing happy songs to the Spirit. I will follow you, follow you wherever you go. There isn't a mountain too steep. But just go, 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 go. Follow, follow. Just climb, climb higher and higher and higher, you know. Yeah. Ain't no mountain high enough. No mountain low. It's just you, you start to just go for it, go for it. And, you know, we all have a, it's really a lifelong relationship and the welcome never ends and that's the mm -hmm. beautiful thing of this, you know. We, we will just keep seeming to come together and come together and inspiring each other. Mm -hmm. It is inspirational when we gather and we come together with this high purpose and music's coming through, new movies will come through, Moodle will come through, Sludo will come through, who knows there'll be something else beyond Sludo. Virtual hugs, Ooh. virtual snuggle puddles. You know, it's like, the, who knows, you know, you, you, it's not going to be dependent on time and space. Already, it's getting less and less dependent on time and space. We make those decisions. No, I'm just stretching. <laughs> yes. No question. Yes. Yeah. What's happening? I had no question. <laughs> okay, well Bo's got the light switch and he's got, he's ready to go. There we go. <laughs> he's he's ready, I can tell. We've reached the the end of the session tonight. <laughs> so thank you all for coming and tomorrow morning I believe if it's a pretty sunny day I believe there they come home and just the quad has arrived. The quad is just Kristen just letting walk through but there's the, there's the quad is yeah tell us a report before we turn the lights off. What's a report from the quad today? Actually, it's very interesting. Was, <laughs> okay. Tell us. <laughs> we went to the uh, airport to get a car, to get the car changed, and then we went to get a bag for Kirsten because hers broke in the way here. And it was like, being in the city was actually, whoa, this is a cocoon. It's like, uh, <laughs> or Palma. You want to go away or to get quiet, like, you can't. This is mm -hmm. the place. But then we started heading back. And then we're just kind of feeling guidance to just have uh, like a coffee somewhere and a nice couch because we've been so busy in the city. And then we, as soon as we said, okay, a couch overlooking somewhere nice and quiet, Hilton sign just appeared right in front of us. We think Hilton would be an obvious place to find things. Hey. Oh, they're going to here. <laughs> they come. The quad. <laughs> It wasn't like that at all. We had to like, the signs would disappear and we'd have to be like, okay, right, left. And we, we sort of kind of gave up at times or if we didn't all feel the same guidance, we'd end up in this like little town not even knowing where we were. We just kind of ended up going back, getting on track. And finally we found this, it was like this big light way off in the middle of nowhere. It's like this castle, this Hilton castle or something. But we saw it was her finca. It was like, we could have given up so many times, mm -hmm. but the Finca, or the Hilton, was uh, kept coming in. And every time, and then we finally got to it, and you'd think the Hilton Hotel would have this grand entrance, but our tiny car barely fit through <laughs> the doorway. It was like, you know, you enter through the narrow gate, uh. and you end up at your Finca. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up in there, and then we were just greeted with, this whole, like nobody else was in the whole place, and it was just this beautiful hotel staff. They're like, hey, you want to have the bar? You want to have a restaurant? What do you want? And so they kind of just. They're happy to see yeah. somebody in there. <laughs> <laughs> so we got our comfy couches and quiet place, and mm. just kind of just took it step by step, and up having good conversations about over a quiet dinner at messengers, boat messengers, and things.
Anything else? Mm -hmm. Good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're all like. <laughs> <laughs> Coming back to the cocoon. The Welcome back to the moon. Spacious <laughs> villas, quiet, you know, music, meditation this afternoon. We watched Ghost Town. Okay. Oh, did you? Laughter, lots of bubbling laughter, especially the back row back there. I tell you, the back row was raucous as usual. <laughs> Well, David, as far as this, this, it's not really a hike. It's really technically it's just a walk. For any of you that are thinking, ooh, hike, it's very, very gentle slope of this, of this little hill. Little <laughs> <laughs> mountain. It's a big hill. It's, <laughs> it's like that. It's one of those. And um, we're not going That's to the right. top. Uh, there's just a sweet little area. Okay. Where you can sit amongst the olive trees and have a sweet little view. And the original thought, which I know we're talking about, was that we'd pick, uh, bring a picnic lunch up there with blankets and sit and meditate and sing and share and whatever. Just spend some time out in nature. Uh, I don't know what the weather's going to be like tomorrow. Um, so as far as the timing, that was what we originally discussed. But obviously that can yeah, I think, and Isabel, so your flight is at 12? Yes. So she probably has to be there about an hour? Yes, uh, for the 11. Mm -hmm. 11, so. So yeah, that's a factor. If it's, mm -hmm. if it's early enough, she said she'd like to go on the walk or hikes, whatever it is. The breakfast. Mm -hmm. I'm taking the breakfast there. <laughs> the breakfast hike. She's hoping for a breakfast hike. <laughs> So, do you have any feel what time you would begin to walk up the hill slash mountain for the hike slash walk? <laughs> These are the two facilitators, so it depends. If you go with, with Jenny, it will be a steeper climb, and if you go with, with the perception of Noel, it will be much easier. I haven't been there. I would walk with Noel. <laughs> Um, well, if we were doing it in time for you to be able to go, um, and if you wanted to have some time yeah. to hang out there, mm -hmm. then we need to go to the town which, um, I don't know about that, <laughs> the last while. Oh, not a light, but we can just settle.